Welcome to Sermon Brainwave with me, Joy J. Moore. And me, Matt Skinner. And me, Caroline Lewis. And me, Rolf Jacobson. The text for today, the third Sunday of Easter, April 18th, 2021, uh, are the first reading is from Acts, as we're in uh, the season of Easter, chapter 3, verses 12 through 19. Psalm chapter 4. The second reading is 1 John chapter 3, verses 1 through 7. And the gospel reading for today is Luke 24, verses 36b through 48. Where are we going to jump in today, fellow rain waivers? Well, the the this scene is the, the scene from Luke 24 is interesting because of the Thomas scene that we saw last week. I, I wonder if we didn't have the, the Thomas story in John 20, would we so quickly assume that when Jesus offers his hands and feet here that they are still wounded or not? Uh, there are some who have argued that when he says, see my hands and feet, what he's saying is, look, I'm okay, you know, and that um, I, that changes a lot of theology, and I, I think that he's probably showing wounds here, uh, nor scars. That's also a good question, right? These open wounds, are they scars, or are they totally clean hands and feet? I tend to think they're still wounded, but I can't really explain why I think that. But it's part of a bigger, uh, bigger conversation where he says, I'm not a ghost. Look, I'm flesh and blood. Uh, in fact, do you have anything I can eat? <laughs> Just to show you that uh, that I'm not a, a, an apparition, I'm not a phantasm or, or anything like that, which is, but at the same time, he has appeared in the room without knocking, or he has appeared in the room without coming through a door, it looks like, which also happens in John. So this interesting um, tension between recognizability, continuity, I'm still the same body, but also discontinuity and newness and unrecognizability. Jesus is now doing things he did not do earlier in the gospel with his body or his, but so there's this idea of, of, a, of a resurrected body, not just simply being a resuscitated body that he has now passed into new life. And what the, what his followers, what his friends are glimpsing here is a glimpse of some kind of new life, some kind of new existence that's transformed existence but also still connecting, you know, this life still matters, right? It's not like this life is just some warm up act or some green room for the real show coming later. Well, and I, I, I think all of that makes it important uh, to go back a couple of verses when it comes to this passage. And you don't ha necessarily have to add verses, but uh, that, that really what happens in this portion of, of, of Luke 24 is, uh, is verse 24, 34, they were saying, the Lord has risen indeed, and he has appeared to Simon. So this, this confession of the Lord has risen indeed uh, is, is really what this, this portion is. Like, what does that mean? What does it mean to say the Lord has risen indeed? And so that's, that's, really, what, that's really what we get. You know, there is a, there is a sort of a counter countermeasure uh, ploy going on here in terms of what other people believed about the resurrection, you know, um, that, like you said, was just a phantasm or uh, just this like resurrected cadaver, or, you know, resuscitated cadaver or something like that. There's something distinctive about, about, uh, about this resurrection of a bodily resurrection. But to say that Jesus Christ is risen indeed, I think that would be helpful for the preacher to say, and this is what that means. Um, and so that, that this, this part, as I said, this part of the passage is really saying, what is the meaning of that confession uh, here? I'm sorry, I had, uh, I had to step away from the podcast. This is one of the weird things about podcasting from our homes. So I've, I've missed the last piece, but I was about to jump in. And so I don't know if someone's already said this. Um, I actually think if you read this in the continuity with Luke 24, it helps uh, with the rest of Luke 24, Matt, it helps. I don't think um, that it's primary, this, this piece about, um, he, he shows him his hand and his feet. I agree with you. I mean, I, I think it's scars, but the point is it's he's showing the wounds of the crucifixion in some way. 
And then do you have anything to eat? I th it may be that there's an element of proving it's not a, you know, some a phantasm, but in the context, just before this, um, these are the disciples who, uh, for whom Jesus had appeared in the breaking of the bread, and they've gone back and they're telling them about this. And so I actually think it's more helpful theologically to uh, connect that. What is the nature of Christ's ongoing uh, participation, or not participation, but presence and revelation in our midst? It's, it's when hospitality is shown to strangers, that he is the stranger being shown. I don't know if you, are, if you guys are like, hey, we already said all that. But it's hospitality. Uh, it's in the breaking of the bread of the community in the hospitality that is shown to strangers. Um, and then in our, of course, being learning to be the guest uh, at other people's, uh, accepting other people's hospitality also. I think that's um, that's the direction I would take that. I absolutely love that, Ralph, and that recognition of uh, what it means to always remember whenever we break bread, the presence of Jesus. Uh, that, that, that there's a real sense here in terms of, for me, of every time we sit down to table with others to remember God among us. And that if you take the narrative from the very beginning, uh, it is always about uh, this sense of hospitality, of reaching out uh, to, to the stranger, of caring for the neighbor, of attending to, to the needy. And sometimes we forget that that is such a central piece in the entire witness of scripture, that God is forming a community that extends that kind of hospitality. Um, I, we hadn't said that, but I'm really glad that you made sure it was heard, Ralph. I think the, you know, the, other, uh, the other part of this passage that, you know, again, and, and again, we've been talking about this, and so it's interesting how this theme has, uh, has continued to uh, be raised in our conversations about witnessing, but uh, that, uh, that, that all of this is a propelling forward, uh, of course, into Acts. But uh, verse 47, repentance and forgiveness of sins that will be claimed in his name to all nations beginning from Jerusalem. And so Acts 1.8 should be like ringing in your head. Um, and you are witnesses of these things. And again, this like, these things is I love the ambiguity of that. Like, uh, where where might you like what what might you choose to witness to? Like Jesus eating the fish, <laughs> or I mean, not really, but maybe I don't know. And uh, no, no, and I'm, I'm still trying to figure out the significance of the fact that it was broiled. I mean, I know as opposed to poached or no, grilled or baked. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I wouldn't poach my fish, but then that's why I'm worried about like, being broiled. The yeah. I'm deep fr okay, we've got off track. Sorry. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And but even that verse 45, then he opened their minds to understand the scriptures. I mean, what did they what did they hear in that that they're going to that they're going to witness to? So there's just this uh, and especially with, when we think that this trajectory this witnessing and then to all nations beginning from Jerusalem then takes us forward into Acts. There's just a, yeah, there's just a remarkable expansiveness of, of uh, an invitation into what does it mean to say Jesus is risen from, you know, the, of verse 34, the Lord has risen indeed. What does that mean? What is that going to mean for you and for, uh, for how we are as a community? and uh, for how we choose to be in the world. And, uh, and so, yeah, I, that's, that's another aspect of this passage I really like. And you just lifted up my favorite verse, uh, verse 45, and then he opened their minds mm -hmm. to understand the scriptures, the reminder that the scriptures are not Matthew through Revelation, which are in the process of being recorded, but these are uh, what we call the First Testament. These are the Hebrew scriptures. These are the scriptures that point it to the promise of God showing up among a people who keep walking out of the story God is writing us into. And the good news about that is that when, when Jesus opens their minds to understand it, the recognition enables them to be the witness that uh, Abraham's 
descendants were called to be, a blessing for all the nations, all the world, uh, beginning at home, but making sure that you cross all those border borders to bear witness to this hospitality, this hope, and this promise of the presence of God. That for me is, um, I, I grew up Baptist and it's supposed to be John 3, 16, but for me, it's Luke 24, 45. Acts? Well, uh, you are witnesses of these things, or we are witnesses now of these things, uh, Matt. Yeah. If, if only well, th there was a commentary If on only the there website. was a commentary. Uh, there or a is. book about or acts a, a book about uh, several books about acts i believe uh so yeah matt's your go-to guy when it comes to acts that's for sure but i i wanted to lift something out of your commentary uh matt that i thought was uh that was really i think really helpful particularly in resurrection preaching of how is it that we have a tendency to over theologize it uh, and uh, and this 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 theological emphasis, as you uh, as you mention, as you write on display in Acts, um, it, to help you to trust. And that I love this line: the quest begins in trust. Theology is what you discover as a result. And so, this emphasis on uh, of trusting in uh, in this in in this confession and trusting in uh, the, uh, the the risenness of Christ and the presence of the Spirit, uh, that 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 takes us on a trajectory of theologizing. <laughs> uh, it's not it's not a matter of understanding it, but it's a trusting in that in that process. And I think there's something that could be really uh, important for preachers to think about, and then for how they communicate. What is it that we do? Uh, in in the midst of of figuring out uh, what we're going to say about Jesus and what we believe about Jesus, that it's that it's a more about a process and a trusting uh, than it is about having answers. I I really appreciated that. And if I if I piggyback on on your commentary, it's uh, the line that preachers should be aware. This is the second description of harmonious communal life. Uh, in this case, among the Jerusalem believers. Uh, I think that's what we've been talking about in so many different ways. Um, the diversity of encounters, this is going back in, in our previous commentaries over uh, this, the past couple of Sundays, said the diversity of the encounters, the adversities, the diversities of responses result in harmonious communities of believers where everyone, that, that hospitality that you talked about, Rolf, that everyone belongs here. I, I think that that's a, a wonderful way to look at this text uh, to, uh, of something to highlight out of the text. So I thank you for that also, Matt. All this stuff works at least through Acts 4. <laughs> things, things start to change in Acts 5. Oh, it may, even we'll see next week, there's conflict at the end of of, of Acts chapter four. I'll just point out one thing that I said in the commentary, which is make sure you extend the verses in, in Acts three, go to the end of the chapter um, as well. If you don't Can believe me. Add verses? Read more. I know it's, have we ever said we should shorten this reading? Um, probably we, we usually add verses, but if you, if you extend it, then it talks about the restoration of all people and I don't know what that means, Matt. Uh, nor do I. That, that universal restoration is 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 interesting. It's it's obviously it has a view towards something bigger, uh, and it's it's connected to you know this notion of times of refreshing. It's it's not a you know this is what drives people trained like all of us crazy. We want to see where else has this been mentioned? Who's Who's he borrowing from? What's what's the echo here? And this is why you need to extend the verses. It, it talks about the prophet like Moses. Um, Peter talks about uh, the promise to Abraham about all the nations being blessed. Talks about the prophets in general. And, and so I usually, if said I've taught on this before, pick your favorite prophetic passage 
that describes an impossible state of affairs and, and imagine something like that. So I, I think Joy's favorite book is Isaiah. I'm sure you can find a few things in Isaiah that describe a transformed world. Just a few. But, but it's also the fact that, this, that universal restoration has such a vague sense in English. So I do like this idea of the restoration of all things, the restoration of all peoples that, and Peter hasn't even figured this out yet. There is no mission to the Gentiles at this point in the story. He's got to be coaxed into that or literally led by the hand by God in chapter 10. At this point, he's still preaching to a, a Jewish audience. He addresses them as Israelites, as Israelites. There's no imagination yet of how this is going to extend beyond Jerusalem. That's part of the quest. That's part of the journey that Peter has to not figure out in advance, but has to live into. And I think that we're still living into as well to figure out what are the implications of a gospel that is truly good news for all people and for all things. And the preparation that you just set up, Matt, in terms of that Peter's on this journey that, um, you know, this isn't the end. It isn't just that I sit at home and tell the people that are like me that we should be doing something more, period, stop. It is, oh, well, if I'm going to say that we should be practicing this hospitality, that we should be proclaiming this hope to all the world, then maybe we should be doing what it is we say. And that's truly a witness that goes into all the world. Yeah, you know, as you do continue to read in Acts 3, uh, talking about this universal restoration, it, it goes back and it quotes, blessed to be a blessing, it, you know, and all the families there should be it, the, the mission of Abraham and Sarah. And so when this mission ends by saying, hey, your sins will be wiped out, it's really the wrong place to stop. Why are your sins wiped out? Because now you're called to participate in that mission of blessing for all the earth. It's, uh, I think that's just such a helpful corrective to so much that's gone wrong in the Christian tradition. So by all means, add the verses and then connect it um, to the ongoing mission to love, save, and bless the whole earth. Psalm 4 is also a short psalm. Talking about people not getting along, uh, <laughs> Psalm 4, uh, it's, uh, Nancy does a nice job, uh, Nancy Kester on the website, but um, what's clear is the psalm writer is surrounded by people who, um, with whom he is not at peace or she is not at peace, and uh, people who uh, either sacrifice to other gods, most likely, or else who are um, accusing the psalm writer and, and uh, putting the psalm writer in danger. And the psalm writer takes uh, refuge in God. And so it is, uh, I mean, it's a nice psalm of comfort in that sense uh, to pray. It's a nighttime psalm. It ends with, I, I lie down and sleep in peace for you alone, uh, Lord, give me safety. So yeah, it's uh, for those times of not community, it's, it's a nice prayer. And then we continue in our reading of uh, 1 John, moving to chapter 3. And, uh, and although I wouldn't, I wouldn't necessarily say you need to add verses, but the preacher, if you're going to preach on this, you need to read farther <laughs> because uh, the, the claim of see what love the Father has given us then uh, is, is really leading into uh, the love one another in verse 11, uh, that, uh, that this love um, from, from God is the defining characteristic of this community. And, and then it, we get this language around sin and really uh, sin here is, is really any activity that's incongruent with the love of God. And so, uh, so making that connection of, of what is, I mean, no wonder the reading stops at verse seven, because verse eight, everyone who commits sin is a child of the devil, which is an unfortunate saying, uh, but uh, an unpleasant saying, but that's, that's really what's at stake here of recognizing that, that what are those, what are those forces that are at work that are opposite to the love of God? 
and that that is central to this community is a way of being and behavior and actions that are congruent with the love that they have already experienced and uh, any any variation out of that is is perceived as sin here's a passage where i would actually cut verses i would stop at verse two and just <laughs> two verses and i want to hear a sermon where somebody preaches to me we're god's children now this is verse two what we will be has not yet been revealed mm. What we do know is this, when he is revealed, we will be like him for we will see him as he is. Mm. I just want some explanation about that. I want some, actually, I don't want explanation. I want imagination about that. This idea of God's children sounds pretty great. But then this idea of, we still don't know the implication. I mean, to go back to the quest or the journey metaphor that I was trying to exploit for Acts 3. This is where we are. and But there still is this hope of a future a transformation. There's a hope of a future of having your mind open to understand the scriptures or a future, hope of a future way of, of kind of expanding this notion of being transformed and to finally see Christ as he is, uh, whatever that looks like, whatever this new life means. Um, maybe I'm getting old. I like more mystery <laughs> in my theology and in my own personal faith. I love that, the e expectation uh, that what we see now is not yet what it is, that what we uh, are used to uh, is not all that the promise of uh, has for us. Caroline, I'm trying to think, uh, you said this a couple of weeks ago, um, and, and I can't pull it up exactly right, so I hope I can make somebody remember, but just this anticipation of, of what isn't uh, oh gosh, you're gonna have to cut that out because I can't remember what it is. But you said something about um, um, not going back to the normal, that we can never go back to what was. Uh, life life it, before the storm is not possible, yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. And, and that's mm -hmm. what I'm, I'm, thank you, <laughs> thank you. Cause that's what mm -hmm. I'm sensing in this journey that you're tying uh, both from uh, this uh, first John, just these first couple of verses, Matt, and the Acts 3 that, that as we proclaim this new community, it's not what it was. It's not even what it is now. And having hope, having anticipation, expecting something more that is better is actually what kept ancient Israel on this journey all this time. It was always a promise of what is yet to be. We still are living in that hope. And so I love the recall of, of let's, let's capture the mystery. Yeah. Just one quick story. People who are sick of the podcast can stop listening now. But I, I'm in one of my courses this semester. I've assigned parts of uh, Dorte Zola's uh, "The Mystery of Death," and one of the things that she says this is gold. It's just like two pages where she says it's it's significant that Abraham is our model. Abraham and Sarah in this are our model because they go on a journey with no end. They go on a journey one direction compared to somebody like Odysseus in the Odyssey who goes on a journey and then comes back and cleans house, right? The purpose of the journey is for him to come back and dominate. And Abraham just lives into vulnerability. And she says, that's how we should view the Christian life as more of a journey towards something. And that I, I thought of that too, and this idea of the desire to go back to where we were after the trauma, to go back to life pre-storm, is it perhaps a desire to dominate? and not a desire to live into the mystery of, of our own finitude, our own vulnerability, and, and of God's love.